Getting compression right is the cornerstone of a great mix. But if you don't know your knee from your side chain, then it can be hard to get compression sounding natural, but with impact. Compression can add punch and even out dynamics, but it can also cause feedback and suck the life out of performance if you use it too much. In this video, you'll learn all the basics about compression from setting thresholds, ratio, attack, and release. We'll also cover the advanced settings like side chaining, setting the knee, and diving into multi-band compression. I'm not saying that you're going to be a master after one video, but when you're done with this video, you will know everything you need to know to master compression. Before we get started, you should grab my compression cheat sheet at offshoreaudio.no forward slash compression or in the link in the description. Let's dive in. How do compressors work? Compressors reduce a percentage of the gain once the gain has crossed a certain point. And this point that you need to cross is called the threshold. So you're looking down at your meters, right? And you got your channel, you gain it up and you get the meters to a little bit about minus 18 decibels, right? And then if you have your compressor turned on, but the threshold is set to minus 18 decibels, nothing happens. Now let's turn the gain up and get our input gain up to minus 15 dB. So that's 3 dB of extra gain. Now the compressor kicks in on that channel. And what happens is that although you've increased the input gain by 3 dB, you won't get 3 dB into your channel fader and then sent to your outputs because it is being compressed. The ratio is the setting that controls how much of that extra gain will reach your channel fader. So for example, a two to one ratio means that for every two dB of signal above the threshold, only one dB will make it out the other side down to your channel fader. So essentially half of what you put in comes out the other side. If we increase that to a three to one ratio, then one third of what you put in would come out the other side. So if we went three dB above, right, we increase from minus 18 to minus 15 dB on our input game. Our threshold is still set at minus 18 dB and we have a two to one ratio. What will happen is we'll actually only see a 1.5 dB increase on the channel fader. And if that ratio was set to three dB, we would only see a one dB increase on our channel fader. So you can use it to even things out. For example, if you have a vocal performance, which is really quiet and also really loud, then you might want to use a bit of compression instead of just riding that fader all night. Metaphor time. A better way to understand how it actually works is thinking about a beach, right? You're running along the beach. You are gain, right? You're uninhibited going along the beach on the sand. Where the sea is, where the water is, that is the threshold of the compression. If you start to run in the water, then you're gonna have to put in more energy to cover the same amount of distance because you will receive resistance from the water, won't you, right? You're receiving compression. The ratio is the depth of the water because if you're just running in the water and it's up to your ankles, then you might only need to put in twice as much effort to cover the same amount of distance. But if you're all the way up to your waist in that water, then let's think of that as like a four to one ratio. You might need to put in four times as much effort as you wade through this water to get to the same place that you're trying to go. And I like this metaphor because it makes me think a little bit more about how sound reacts to compression. Because when you put a vocal into a compressor, right, when you compress that vocal, you will hear the vocal pushing into the threshold of the compressor. You will hear it almost as if like it is impeded by something, it is being softened. And I think that that is sort of like wading in the sea. Maybe it didn't make sense, but you've got the technical definition as well. So we have a couple of other really important basic settings on a compressor, right? You have the attack time and the release time. Now, in simple terms, the attack time is how quickly the compressor activates once the gain has crossed the threshold, right? So as soon as your gain trips over 18 dB, how quickly does that compressor get into action? And the release time is the opposite, right? It's once that gain drops below the threshold again, how quickly does the compression stop happening. So let's think about a drum, right? A snare drum. When you hit the snare drum, there's the initial impact, the attack, and then there's the tail as the drum rings out. If you have a really, really fast compressor, then the compression starts the second that that initial impact crosses the threshold, right? So you're compressing the whole drum sound. But if you set a longer attack time, then you may actually miss out that first initial whack of the snare, and the compression starts later and affects the tail the resonance of the drum. Similarly, if you paired a very fast release with that very fast attack, you might only tame that initial whack of the snare drum and you would be essentially bringing that peak down more in line with the resonance, the tail. You would even out the sound of the drum. 
or if you had a really, really long release time and quite a long attack time, you let that initial transient through, but you are sort of squashing the tail, the resonant section of that snare drum. Now again, this is pretty nebulous. It's quite difficult to conceptualize that. So let's go back to the water metaphor. The attack time is how quickly you end up in the depth of water, right? So if you're running along the beach, you are again, and then suddenly there is a puddle. The puddle is shallow, therefore it's a low ratio, call it two to one, and suddenly you're in the puddle. That's a fast attack time because you just fell straight in there. The compression happened at once. Very quickly, you need to use more energy to cover the same amount of distance. You need more gain to get the same amount of output. However, if you ran straight head first into the sea and there was a gentle slope down, that's a very, very slow attack because as you run into the water, at first you keep your energy up, right? You're making good progress. But as you get deeper and deeper into the water, the full weight of the compression hits you. And again, the total depth that you end up at, that would be the ratio, right? So attack and release, how quickly the compressor turns itself on and off once we enter compression. Now let's chat a little bit about the knee setting on the compressor because this is a little bit of a weird one, right? But essentially the knee affects how quickly the compressor ramps up to full effect. If you have a hard knee, it means when you cross the threshold, you are immediately into full compression. If you have a soft knee, then it means as you cross the threshold, the compression gently ramps up to the full ratio. So the ratio increases smoothly as the gain goes above the threshold. On one hand, attack is time-based, right? Once you cross the threshold, it's only a matter of time before the compression is enabled. Knee is level-based. The further across the threshold you go, the more compression you enter. And I don't think I have a beach metaphor for our knee yet. I'll have to think of one. Another control that's on every compressor is makeup gain, right? Because what you're doing is you're reducing the amount of gain that is making it to the channel fader. When things get loud, you turn them down. And then to compensate for turning them down and getting compression, you can use the makeup gain to add more gain back in afterwards. I don't tend to use it on live shows. I don't ever really think I need it. I'm not using enough compression that it makes a huge difference to where my channel fader is. And hopefully with gain staged properly enough that losing three to five decibels off the top of your signal is not going to change your show. By all means, use the makeup gain if it makes you feel good, but I don't ever use it and I never have a problem. So let's talk about when to use and when not to use compressors. Compressors are something that I use quite a lot. They are incredibly useful in controlling dynamics, but also shaping tone. So why don't you try using them to fatten up a snare sound? If you have a snare and you want it to sound bigger, fatter, why don't you try a three to one ratio with a sort of medium slow attack, like 25 milliseconds, and maybe a medium release, like 100 milliseconds, and you wanna dial that in to get like four or five decibels of gain reduction when you're getting these snare hits. On the other hand, maybe your drummer is really uneven, maybe they don't play consistently, and you wanna use that really, really fast attack, like one millisecond, and a really, really short release, like 10 milliseconds, to get like three to four dB of gain reduction. And what you're gonna do is you're gonna even out the difference in the sort of impact of the snare hits while keeping the tail intact. Try using it on vocals to even out a vocal performance. I usually set an attack time of about 10 milliseconds, a release time of somewhere between 50 and 100, and I use a 4 to 1 ratio. And in this, I usually use a soft knee as well. And I just dial the threshold down until I'm getting sort of like 5, 6 decibels of gain reduction when the vocalist is kind of going hard at it. And what this soft knee does is it means that when they sing the quiet passages, I might still tickle the compressor just a little bit, but then once they get really full pelt into it, I get more compression, harder on it, so I control the levels a bit better. I use it to even out bass guitars as well. I usually set an attack time of about 25 milliseconds and a release time of about 100 milliseconds as a starting point. I use a low ratio of about two to one, and then I just dial that in until I'm getting a good solid amount of gain reduction on most of the notes. So it just evens everything out slightly. Basically my bass is constantly pushing against that compressor. So it's taking more energy from the bass to create these surges that might be undesirable because you want your bass to be nice and even. Acoustic guitar is another great one and there's two ways of dealing with it. If you've got loads of finger picking, delicate notes and you want to even out all the notes, try using a fast attack time and a slower release time. Or if someone's strumming and you want to accentuate the dynamics of their strumming, use a slower attack and a faster release. And for these, maybe use about a two to one ratio as well. I don't tend to go much higher than four to one ratio whenever I'm compressing. 
But the more that you use the compression, the more you will hear how the instruments play with that, how the attack and release time affects the swelling of the compressor and how things like vocals and bass push against the compressor and kind of give you that different tone, which is often desirable. If we're talking about when to use it, we need to talk about when not to use it. Danger zone. If you have a lot of feedback on your vocals already, or you're really, really on the edge of feedback, if your vocal is in front of the PA, avoid heavy compression, because what you're doing is you're decreasing the difference between the loud bits and the quiet bits. And do you know what is in the quiet areas of your sound spectrum? Feedback. When you're compressing, you are giving yourself less gain to work with. So you might need to turn that vocal higher to get the desired gain. And if you turn it up higher, you're gonna run into feedback quicker. You can still use it, but be careful if you're in front of the PA or if you're in a feedback danger zone. You also don't want to use compressors on really, really dynamic performances. Classical music, you're gonna get shouted at by the musicians. Jazz music, you're gonna get shouted at by the musicians. In fact, it's a golden rule to just not use compression without asking the performers first if it's okay. Jazz and classical musicians especially are so sensitive to this stuff, they will hear in an instant if you put a compressor on something that they're playing. So it's best to just clear the air, ask first, can I use a little compression or just leave it uncompressed? Let's dive into some of the more advanced topics then, right? Starting with side chaining. What is side chaining? Side chaining is when your compressor reacts to a separate channel or input than the channel that you have activated it on, right? So if you've got your vocal and you turn your compressor on and you turn your threshold down, when the vocalist sings, you activate compression. If you use a sidechain input, then you can turn the compressor on on the vocal, but have it only activate compression when the bassist is playing. Now, that's a terrible example, so let's use a better example. Your bassist is playing and you turn the compressor on in their channel, but you actually want it to only compress heavily when the kick drum sounds. So you use a sidechain input on the bassist's compressor and you tell it to listen to the kick drum. That way, every time the kick drum is played, the bass guitar is gonna dip. And you can use your controls, threshold, ratio, attack, release, to determine how much the bass guitar is gonna dip in volume every time the kick drum plays. You might have an MC on the stage with a backing track, and when they're not performing, you want the backing track to be louder. Maybe you're gonna have a compressor on the backing tracks, side-chained to the MC's vocal mic. So whenever the MC sings, shouts, talks, I don't know, what does an MC do? Whenever they do something with their microphone, it dips the backing track a little bit. So that allows their vocal to come through easier, and when they stop singing, the track naturally swells up to fill the void. Obviously, in these circumstances, it's really important to tune attack, release, and threshold properly so you don't get an unnatural swelling or dipping. But it gets better. You can actually sidechain the compressor to itself, but at a certain frequency. If you've got a vocal mic and it's standing in front of the bass amp, right? And the bass is triggering the compressor on your vocal. You can turn the sidechain input on, put it to self, we call it self-keying the input, and then you can apply a filter this is all usually in the controls on the compressor. And you can tell it to listen to maybe like one kilohertz, somewhere where you get a lot of vocal and not a lot from the bass guitar. And that way, your compressor is gonna be more sensitive to that frequency range when it activates, and you'll get a more even compression on the vocal, which is not triggered by the bass, just as an example. Now, even though your compressor is only listening to specific frequencies, it is still compressing the whole channel, all of the frequencies in the vocal mic. One level up from this is to use multi-band compression. And this is the same thing, except that you actually only compress that section of the frequency spectrum. I used it the other day because I had a vocalist who was sometimes just a little sibilant. I put a compressor on everything above two kilohertz. And that way it's only when they approach the microphone from a certain direction and give a certain performance that the compressor kicks in on those specific frequencies. If I had just turned those frequencies down, then the vocal might have been too dull for the performance. But because I was compressing just those high frequencies, it means that less of the sizzle and the high frequency content from that vocal performance is coming through into the PA but only when it's present. You might also use this on bass guitar. If you have a little bit too much of certain frequencies that come through on certain notes on the bass guitar, you can just set up a multiband compressor to only compress that area, let's say mids from 100 to 500, only compress that area when the bassist plays the notes that are problematic. Now you also find different types of compressors. 
The most popular ones are called FET and OPTO compressors, though there are a few more. And usually if you head to the effects rack of your digital mixer, then you'll find that you can add certain types of classic compressor emulations into the rack. And what you do then is you set up an insert point using the channel that you want to compress. I've got a whole video on insert points, I'll leave it up here somewhere. But these different types of compressors operate in slightly different ways. FET compressors tend to be a little bit more punchy, a little bit more aggressive, and you might use them to add character to a sound when you want it to have a more distinct characteristic. You don't want to be transparent at all. While opto compressors are generally more gentle sounding, more transparent, and you use them to control gain without sounding really, really compressed. So if you are beyond the basics of compression and you're looking for an extra bit of spice in your live sound engineering life, God knows we all need that, then you might try out FET and OPTO compressors, which you'll find in the rack on your mixer. The last thing I want to talk about is expanders because they're not really compressors, but quite often you find them on the compressor page on your digital mixer. And what an expander does is the exact opposite of a compressor. Whenever the signal, the gain, crosses the threshold that you set, it gets an extra boost. If you set a ratio of two to one, then for every one decibel that crosses the threshold, two decibels of signal would get sent to your fader. This can be really helpful for having less drum spill in your vocal microphones. And when the vocalist starts singing, it gets that kick up and gain that it needs. This is not a video about expanders though, so if it's on your mixer, go and have a play with that. I hope that was helpful. Here's a video on gating if you need more mixing tips, and if you need to know how to insert your fancy compressors, I'll leave a video up here. Leave a comment, let me know what compression settings you're using, and if this was helpful, like the video and subscribe to the channel. I'll see you in the next one. Goodbye.